Well, let me begin first by echoing what Anurag said. Uh, while I am here in Tokyo, my heart is fully in India uh, with all my colleagues, uh, their families, my friends and so on. There's so many people that have been touched by COVID and, uh, and, and we continue to fight, to struggle, but we will persevere. And as Anurag said, this too shall pass. I'm so inspired by, by how everyone in India is showing resilience and grit and positivity through such a, a tough time of adversity and ambiguity. So hang in there, stay safe. Uh, we will get through this together. On that note, it's my pleasure today to talk to you about something that I'm very passionate about, and that's leadership. So I'll just share my screen here. Today, I'd like to speak to you about redefining the role of the leader in this new world of work. And we talk a lot about the new normal. I would argue that what we're experiencing right now is in by no means normal. And so I would hesitate to use the words new normal. Instead, let's call it the new world. Over history, there have been so many turning points, forks in the road and triggers that led to a domino effect. You can go right back to the, the invention of the wheel, which completely changed the world and we never looked back. It was a new world. Fast forward to the industrial revolution, factory automation, mass production. Again, it was a new world. Again, fast forward to the internet, uh, and, and we knew what happened then. Our world has never been the same since the internet was invented and since we all embraced it. So we are moving into a new world. Of course, a new world of work, but a new world of collaborating, communicating, and of course, working. And ultimately, for leaders, that means a new way of leading. And so I'd like to talk about that today. Anurag, you had a wonderful quote, and I'd like to adapt it a bit, that the purpose of leadership is to lead with purpose. This is perhaps the most valuable lesson that we've all learned as leaders over the past one year plus. Purpose was something that was in our hearts. It was on the wall in our mission and our vision statements, but it became so critical as leaders to put this at the very front of every conversation. And for many leaders, and I, I meet with CXOs every day uh, over the past 14 or 15 months, many leaders struggled with this one because purpose was something on the side and now purpose had to be right in the middle of everything we do. And, and that was foreign for a lot of leaders. The leaders who embrace purpose are now leading organizations that are accelerating, that are moving forward. Jim Collins in his book, Great by Choice, talks about the two types of companies, the two types of organizations, teams, and the two types of leaders. And he simply put it like this, the one type, these are the leaders and the organizations that survive during times of crisis. And for them, that's considered winning. Surviving is winning. And certainly you could argue that, especially in what we faced over the past year. But the organizations, the good to great organizations, as he wrote about in his book, were led by leaders who found a way to thrive during times of crisis. In other words, crisis can bring opportunity to grow, grow personally, professionally. Of course, the organization can grow as well. This, this takes a lot of courage. Uh, this also takes a very different way of leading. Now, the leaders who focus on surviving, you would look at the pie chart on the left. Most of their time is spent talking about the how and the what, and very little time is spent talking about the why. And by the way, I would even argue that this is true during good times. Forget about COVID for a moment. Many organizations are led with this split, more focused on the logistics, the tactical items, the how and the what, and less on the why. The why was something on the side. The organizations that are sustainable, and if you look at companies that have been around for more than 100 years in India and around the world, they all have a powerful purpose, a compelling purpose, which is at the heart and soul of everything they do. And leaders typically spend much more time talking about the why than they do about the how and the what. Of course, the how and the what lead to the outcomes, but the why, the greater purpose, the North Star, if you will, uh, is what takes you forward through good times and in bad. And with that, during COVID, we heard this phrase a lot, burning platform. We have a burning platform. And you know, when you think about what burning platform really means, let's take it right into our homes. If your house is on fire, you grab the things that are most important for you and you run out of the house. And sometimes we choose the wrong things in retrospect. We regret, uh, we, should have, we should have taken that photo album or we should have grabbed our passport or, or whatever it is. Um, and so when you have a burning platform, you tend to make decisions that might not be the best decisions in the long run. 
And so a lot of organizations fell into that trap and it's understandable uh, for all of us as leaders, there was no playbook on how to navigate through this, this unprecedented crisis, the fear, the uncertainty, the ambiguity that came with it. But the leaders that are now leaving, leading organizations that are thriving focused less on a burning platform and took the opportunity to go back to the burning ambition. And what we do know is that the burning ambition is rooted deeply in purpose. And we never compromise on the purpose. We might pivot. We might have the guts to pivot, especially in tough times, on the how and the what, but we never compromise on the why. A burning ambition is at the heart and soul of every sustainable organization. Every leader that leads in a sustainable organization that continues to grow and thrive during tough times as well, knows that it's so important to hold on firm to that ambition. And the ambition is not about an outcome. And you know, it's interesting, a lot of conversations I had with leaders, especially in India over the past 14 months, and certainly now here in Japan, that we're talking less and less about outcomes and we're talking more and more about purpose. Well, what we do know is that when you have a compelling purpose and you bring people together and you rally them around that purpose, the outcomes will follow. So moving the outcomes to the end of the discussion is one important muscle that leaders need to develop, especially moving forward. So let's talk a little bit about that and, and how I lead and some of the discoveries I've made over the past 14 months particularly. You'll notice on this, let's call it an algorithm of leadership, you'll notice that outcome comes at the very end. And I absolutely believe, and this has been reaffirmed over the past 14 months, that when you have the right people, and I say right people with the right values first, skill set second. Values cannot be taught. They're already ingrained by the time they reach us. But skills can be taught. People with the right values, the right skill set, supported by a compelling vision, which is about purpose, not about outcomes, not about profit, not about growth. Those will come and we are all measured on that. Absolutely. At the end of the month, the end of the quarter, the end of the year, I'm measured on the outcomes that I deliver as the leader of Randstad. But ultimately, that's the final step. That's the result of having the right vision which is compelling, it touches the hearts and the minds. It's about purpose, it's about impact on the world. And of course, having a leadership team that walks the talk, that lives and breathes those values without exception, passionate, committed, dedicated to bringing that vision to life. And of course, values runs deep throughout this story. And tools, we talk a lot about tools. Sometimes tools is technology. Sometimes tools is just an environment where people are able to move freely, to experiment, to try, to learn, to fail, to get back up. And of course, in our current world, as we move forward, digital becomes a good part of that story. So when you take all of this together, the right people, with the right vision, with the right leaders, with the right values, the right tools, and you put all of that together, the right outcomes will follow. And that is so important now for leaders to recognize, especially as we now move into this new way of working, which we'll talk about later, which is going to be hybrid, digital and flexible. So let's talk about muscles. As an athlete, I'm constantly thinking about how I can improve, how I can get stronger, or more agile and so on. And if you think about how much time we spend in the gym or on physical activities, fitness, trying to get in shape or trying to be a bit faster or better, um, but take that in terms of leadership. How much time do we actually spend building the specific muscles which are required to be effective, to be an effective leader? So I'd like to raise a few key muscles that I think are important, especially as we move into the new world. One, autocratic versus collaborative. Many of us have grown up in a world of leadership where, you know, at the end of the day, the buck stops with the leader and the leader makes a decision, but the leader also takes a responsibility. And sometimes that requires a top down approach, a mandated approach. And that will still be necessary. I mean, let's face it, India is the world's largest democracy and certainly Japan, where I am now, consensus driven leadership is important. But at the end of the day, a decision needs to be made. And sometimes it's autocratic, but I would say that's a, a very small minority of, of the cases. Leadership moving forward requires an important muscle the ability to, to lead in a collaborative manner, to bring people together, as I said earlier, to rally a team together towards a common goal. That can't be mandated. Passion cannot be mandated. So collaborative leadership becomes more and more important. How to bring people together towards a purpose, not towards an outcome. The outcomes will follow. Outcomes versus people. Again, if we focus too much on the spreadsheet and too much on the EBITDA and the revenue growth and so on, and less on the people, the outcomes will not follow. So it's so important that, that 
the leader of the future, the leader of today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, is shifting the focus heavily towards people first, outcomes second, getting to know our people. And certainly over the past year plus, you know, I've been able, like many leaders, to get into the living rooms and the dens and the kitchens of, of colleagues and their family members. I've learned so much about colleagues that I worked with very closely before, that, things that I didn't know about them, in a way, thanks to this work from remote, um, you know, the, the challenge that we face. The next one is logical versus emotional. I'm a strong believer that the exceptional leaders, and certainly the ones that I've studied and researched uh, and observed in my journey, have a nice balance between being logical and emotional. Certainly too much of either is not, uh, is not healthy, but there is a time when a leader needs to be especially human. And I would say that's true during a time of crisis right now. We talk about compassion and empathy, caring and so on. Many of the leaders who grew up in an autocratic way of leading, an outcome focused way of leading are now faced with talking about people first and showing emotion, showing care and empathy and compassion. It's difficult for a lot of leaders. It takes work. It takes work. It's a muscle that needs to be built, especially moving forward. And finally, pace setter versus supporter. Again, I would say I'm guilty of that. I grew up uh, as a leader who was typically setting the pace. And, and many of the, um, the leaders that I talk to, certainly the CEOs, uh, have a profile which is heavy on pace setter. If you've done 360 degree assessments, you know that pace setters are typically the ones who are a bit dominant and lead from the front. I've realized, and I know many of the leaders I speak to now, we've all had a revelation that we need to shift from pace setter to supporter, to enabler. And I'll talk a bit about more of that later on. So these are actually four different muscles that need to be built in order to lead into the future. Empathy and compassion are two key elements of the human piece that we talked about a second ago, the emotional piece. Now, empathy is a very interesting word. We talk about it a lot. And if you look at leadership competencies, most organizations have a list of competencies. Certainly integrity would be one. Empathy has been on most of the leadership companies of organizations around the world for many, many years. But when you look at the meaning of empathy, it's actually a reactive response to someone's situation. In other words, you feel for their, their challenge, the predicament that they're in. But when you hang up the phone, there's no action. Empathy is not about action. Empathy is about feeling. So taking empathy two steps further is compassion. And I'm a big believer, and I've discovered this over the past year plus, that empathy must lead to action, action to support the person who needs help. And we've certainly seen that with the challenges of mental health that have come about as a result of working from remote and the fear that's been around COVID. So compassion is actually a muscle connected to being human, being authentic, being emotional. And a lot of leaders are struggling with this one. I know I certainly was in the beginning, uh, but I've come to realize just how important it is and it must be genuine. So the magical formula, if you will, I would say previously, uh, if we talk about leadership of the past, we started with productivity discussions. We talked about how are we going to improve productivity for impact to help us get to our goals. Productivity now comes at the end because what we do know is that an organization, a team of people that feel safe, that are engaged and connected with the purpose will then be productive. And so there are lots of ways to do that. At, at Randstad and certainly many of the organizations that, that I support and that we support at Randstad and the leaders I speak to, we immediately shifted last March into talking about physical fitness. I can't count how many videos were on LinkedIn and Facebook and so on. And I know Anurag as well got right into it and continues to, to um, focus on physical health and fitness. I did as well. And so we, we were all creating videos of our workout routines and inspiring colleagues with that. But then we came to realize quickly that being kind to your body was not enough. This was a marathon we were facing. And as a result, we realized that mental and emotional health became extremely important and an important part of the equation. So we launched something called Be Kind to Your Mind at Randstad, where we engage with an organization called Your Dost, Your Friend, uh, where they would support on, on giving um, counseling and so on to people who needed someone to speak to. We launched a COVID task force internally. Many companies have done this. Colleagues caring for colleagues. Wellness webinars, uh, you know, again, uh, third parties, having, having experts come in from outside to advise on how to handle uh, this, this challenge, how to stay physically and mentally fit. And of course, a COVID aid kit, which many organizations have launched and we just distributed to all of our colleagues across the four corners of India. And finally, a spirit of better than yesterday. 
One of the dangers in times of crisis is that we get stuck. We stop, we come to a halt. It's so important that we continue to move forward in some way, shape or form. Keeping the wheels moving is, is one step closer to coming out of the crisis. So the new world of work, clearly we hear hybrid. What does hybrid really mean? It means flexibility. It means working, uh, leveraging digital to accomplish the tasks. Uh, but it really is a new way of working that leaders will have to adjust to and learn how to lead from. I've always led in a world of presenteeism where my colleagues were right in front of me, uh, but now they're not. And, and how do we do that? It's a muscle that needs to be built. In order to be future ready, a truly future ready leader, we need to embrace tech and embrace tech, not for the touch. Tech should not replace the touch. It's so important that we use tech for the transactional elements of what we do as leaders, but never replace the touch. That's where the leader again needs to show uh, authentic, human, emotional behavior, caring, and of course, compassion. So just to come to the end of, of my presentation, uh, as, as Anurag would have mentioned earlier, I wrote a book called The E5 Movement. And the fourth E is very important, especially right now. Each of these are muscles, by the way. The fourth E is enable. Leader is enabler. A leader who moves from pace setting, who moves from knowing how to do, to helping others know how to do, to helping others shine. In other words, becoming committed to helping the people around you become the best version of themselves. And to me, that's leadership as we move into the day after tomorrow. It needs to be focused on enabling everyone to shine. And so leadership ultimately is about creating a movement. You can define leadership in many, many different ways, but if I had to break it down, it's about creating a movement. In order to create that movement, new muscles are now required as we move into the new world. So here's the good news. The answers are in the room. I can, I would suggest to you that any challenge, any problem you face in the organization, uh, whether it's business or beyond, the answers are in that virtual room. When you gather smart people together with great values, uh, the answers will be in the room. So elicit those answers, enable others to find the answers and then support them. Finally, Arnold Schwarzenegger has a wonderful quote. You know, he said, no one ever built muscles by simply walking into the gym. That's just the first step. The next step is to do the work. And I believe it's exactly the same with leadership. Leadership is a series of muscles that we've all built along our journey. And you can wake up in the morning and decide to build these muscles, but you've got to do the work. Clearly, there are new muscles that are required as we move into this new world, a new way of communicating, collaborating, and of course, delivering on our promise. So let's all come together and do the work. So we'll have the muscles to be prepared to lead into the day after tomorrow. And I'll pause here, Anurag, and back to you. Thank you so much, Paul. I have, I'm always excited about what we do, but I was more excited yesterday evening because I'm going to meet you today, though virtually. I know you're in Japan. And I did come to Japan in 2010, once to Tokyo. It's a fascinating country, uh, rich in culture, and uh, very progressive in some ways, and very ritualistic and culturally rooted in some ways. So clearly you know more about Japan than I do, but happy to see you uh, virtually though. And uh, you know, the beauty about uh, one thing that we discovered is uh, that locations don't matter. Physical distances don't matter. Feels like when you were in Bangalore, it felt the same. Now you're in Tokyo, it feels the same. It does that in yes. my mind, I know. And thank you for that lovely presentation, setting the context. And you're right, uh, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, there are lots of things about Arnold Schwarzenegger. I read his, uh, I was coming back from Cannes and at the Vienna airport, I bought his uh, uh, autobiography. Yeah. Uh, he was born in Gaz and, you know, again, uh, there are a lot of positive things that you can learn from him. There's some things you shouldn't, uh, which he <laughs> talked about in his bi biography. Yeah. Yeah. But clearly as somebody, and a lot of people say that he could have been the president of America if there was not that rule that the American president has to be a uh, natural born citizen of America because he had that popularity and he did become the governor of California. And he's right uh, that, you know, just by expressing an intent or just showing up is not good enough. Action is the way to solve uh, every problem. It's also the way to achieve your dreams. So he's so right. And I think in the last 15 months, the CEOs, the HRO, have been in an action mode uh, and dealing with dynamic situations over which they did not have control. 
uh, you know i want to ask you about three aspects paul you were you were in various parts of the world uh, yeah. and you know you had a four year stint in india and you still look mm-hmm. after india uh, from tokyo uh, you know which is the new ceo md and ceo but you both he was your cfo tell me how are cultural nuances different when it comes to this transition in covid times give us one or two examples from india from japan just to kind of set a context uh, yeah so i i would say first of all yeah i had an incredible <clears throat> four years in india and honor of course came to know you and and i think i do see you more now virtually than i saw you in the past whenever i flew up to delhi we would we would meet and you would come down to bangor and so on but in a way covid has given us the opportunity to do this more often so i would say in that sense it's been a blessing you know first of all I'll take it back for a moment this was a question i was asked a lot when i first arrived in india um what's the difference between leading say in india and in japan and i've lived and worked in singapore and many other countries as well but, you know i think i think there are actually more similarities than there are differences leadership effective leadership is timeless and borderless it it is immune to culture there are certain things about effective leaders that we've seen over history that are common and that is they walk the talk they 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 have the back of their people in good times and in bad they show conviction no matter what the storm is no matter what the adversity is we face we're going to get through this that's the message they give they're focused on purpose but if we talk about cultural nuances india is a very uh, well every country is unique but india for me was completely foreign when i first arrived 4 years ago i'd never been to india i knew nobody in india i had the only context i had may have been what i watched on the discovery channel and that wasn't necessarily the most accurate version of india living there there's nothing nothing replaces living there first of all india as you know very well anurag is a, an extremely emotional culture and and that can be a good thing but it can also be a challenge as a leader now if we look at the past 1 year plus uh i'm absolutely touched and and uh, i'm amazed by the amount of emotion that has been shown by leaders in india by default the leaders that i spoke to in the early days last march they were immediately talking about people they weren't talking about outcomes they weren't talking about profit and how the business would be hurt by covid they were talking about their people and i found that to be very unique about india at the same time india is a land of abundance it's the it will be the fastest growing economy the world bank has said so when we get through covid watch out india will be the fastest growing economy in the world the youngest workforce by average age in the world and the fastest growing not to mention make in india skill india fdi continues to increase there are a lot of geopolitical issues as well so what we know is that the future is very bright for india but in a land of abundance it's like uh the kids in the candy store you know where do you start where do you begin and in india there there are more options than than one can handle so it's about being clever it's about being smart and being selective in deciding what to do and what not to do because we know that effective strategy is also about deciding what not to do and in india that's an important muscle for a leader to have in japan on the other hand uh, if i compare um the situation it's an aging society at the same time very strong economy continues to be in the top 3 in the world um and i suspect this will continue for some time heavy focus on quality consensus leadership becomes very important it's not fully democratic but there's a process everyone needs to be heard it takes time what you may accomplish in one meeting in india it may take three meetings in japan but the outcome will be very similar you can bet in japan that the execution will happen and it will happen well so you know i look at two key elements of india and japan on iraq one is jugad which i learned a lot about first hand as a leader in india uh and then kaizen in japan these are at opposite polar extremes but actually when you bring these two together and combine them what an amazing combination so yeah i i i would say that <clears throat> being in india for 4 years i built a lot of muscles thanks to leading in india that will now serve me well as i move on to my role in japan you know i want to send you a beautiful article which i kind of agree a friend of mine wrote uh and the article is why should we shouldn't be relying on jugad because yeah. sometimes we take shortcuts and mm-hmm. if you know especially in this last 7 weeks within our healthcare system because we are not perfection oriented and i have to say we're perfection oriented in a lot of things but sometimes we are not detailed and so on and so forth so we are not able to you know accomplish what we set out in a perfect way life is imperfect but you know sometimes jugad is not the best way 
Sometimes so, it is. Anurag, on I that would one, say, it's, yeah, it's a I would say frugal innovation. It's, yeah, okay, fluid innovation, creativity, or but frugal, also like, frugal innovation. Uh, frugal. Well, let's take it one step for, further. Frugal innovation to execution. And I think that's that's one of the challenges in India that I faced is is ensuring that that the the mission is executed on with quality. That's what Kaizen is about. But the speed and agility of India is unrivaled. If you can marry that with attention to quality, then watch out. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I'm sure you're missing India already, um, and I'm sure you'll get an Very opportunity. Good. Let me ask you my second question, Paul. Uh, the last seven weeks. They have been very tough for India okay? and in and so on and so forth. And leaders are also human, you know. They have families, they have feelings. Um, we talked about self-care. You know, how, how do you think self-care is even more important in these times? Oh, it's it's never been more important, Anurag. And we've heard the example of the oxygen mask on the airplane <clears throat> talked about often, right? If you're going to help the person next to you, when the airplane's in trouble or when someone's in trouble, you need to make sure you have the oxygen mask on first before you help the person. And the reason for that is you need to be capable of helping. Otherwise, you will need help. And this is one important discovery that many leaders have started to make in recent months. And I'd say especially the past seven weeks, which have absolutely been tragic for so many people that are, are close to all of us and, and, it's, and it's ongoing daily. Um, and that becomes heavy for a leader, especially if you're leading an organization where you're constantly hearing about people who are you know, sick with COVID or even worse, uh, people passing away from the disease. And so it's just such a, a heavy burden to carry. At the same time, you know, it's also important not to take any of this personally as a leader. And that's tough. That's tough not to do. I just said earlier that one of the muscles we need to build as leaders is to be caring, be authentic, be human, show compassion. And, and feel how the other person's feeling something about it. But you know, at the end of the day, the leader absolutely needs to be strong and authentically strong. And that means caring for yourself first. So, I, you know, I'm a big believer. I learned from professional athletes. You look at Sachin Tendulkar, um, TV Sindhu and others. <clears throat> they had long careers and they stayed in a zone through their career. Everybody has ups and downs. Everybody has good days and bad days, slumps as well. Uh, and many athletes go into depression as well because of the pressure. I think it's very similar to leaders. You need to find that healthy cadence, that healthy zone and protect it at all costs. And it begins with, you know, how you start your day, food that you eat, the, the information that you put into your body, um, knowing when to turn off the news and so on. You know, it's so important to do that. So Anurag, to answer your question, I would say, the ability to care for yourself and stay strong, especially in a time of crisis, is a critical element of being an effective leader moving forward. You know, and again, uh, the, as I said in my opening notes, and in some way in your presentation, also it was uh, reflected. The last seven weeks, of course, because of the severity of the disease, what were your reflections when that was happening? What were your new thoughts as a leader, as somebody who's responsible? for a large number of people, including a senior management team. What were your thoughts? Well, one thing was, was sure, um, I was afraid. Huh? I was afraid for my people. <clears throat> of course, you know, also concerned for your own family. I had my family with me in India as well. But, you know, I was so <clears throat> concerned about our people. Um, and there was that, that fear that it was going to get worse. That was one feeling, I must say, absolutely. And I admitted that to my team. At the same time, stronger than the fear, was the commitment and the passion to support in any way we could. So while I was you know, concerned and even afraid at times, I was extremely motivated, 100% committed to doing everything in our power to support. And you saw earlier some of the things we did. We distributed COVID aid kits. We brought in oxygen generators from Europe and United States. They're now being used, by the way, to save lives. I and mean, we, we, we continue to do things to support. So certainly um, I was in action mode, but I was also very frustrated. You know, Anurag is so helpless. huh? As a leader, we are used to having a certain element of control, especially as a CXO, a CEO. Um, you know, we have a certain element of control over the direction of the organization, of where the ship is going, how fast the ship moves, et cetera, et cetera. You know, at, at, at one point we were helpless. And that helplessness is so alien to, to most leaders. So that, that, was, uh, that was tough to deal with. But again, I'll go back to what I said earlier, Anurag. 
you hold firm to the purpose, you keep your eyes on the North Star, especially in those moments of helplessness and frustration, it's so important to lock on the purpose. Thank you so much. Uh, my last question, and I'll let you go. I could go on talking to you. <laughs> Again, um, there has been in the past this debate about work-life balance, right? Yeah. And we in some way are boundaryless working, with work from anywhere. Um, earlier we would in some way shut off when we were at home, you know, and again refresh it in the morning. But today there is a boundaryless working. What happens to is the work-life balance debate being accentuated, or you know, we shouldn't be debating it at all anyway. Well, I, I, even before COVID, I, I, I suggested we should stop talking about work-life balance um, because. I think that was a, that was a, an era where we didn't have digital, where you had to physically go to a workplace and do the work. And once you left that workplace, you were separated from the work because there was no way to contact you. Know, maybe a landline, but you wouldn't get a call unless there was an emergency on your landline at home while you're having dinner with your family, right? But then with digital, mobile, and internet, the work came right into our homes. It came right to the dinner table. So work-life balance, this concept of switching on, switching off is long gone. I would rather we talk about work-life integration. I think what we're experiencing right now is an integration of work and life. So as I sit here in my home in Tokyo, after I say farewell to you, I'll go in my living room and I'll sit with my wife and I'll have a coffee. I'll continue to watch this enclave, by the way, but I'll do it sitting on my sofa with a coffee on a Saturday afternoon in Tokyo. But that's a choice I make. That's a choice I make. And I may do some emails around work and so on. I may not. I may go and, and go for a walk and so on. So the flexibility, the choices that come now, I think are very important. So work-life integration to me is the way forward. I think we need to be prepared to integrate. Don't resist this, this uh, you know, this integration of both, but also know when, when to turn off. So as I leave this room and open the door, I will be turning off and I'll be in the moment. So that takes work. I would even argue that's probably a muscle as well. Thank you so much, Paul. I, I am hopeful that you will see more often of you. Hopefully your second book will come out, The E5 Moment or The Rule of Five. Uh, we can see the poster frame behind yeah. you. It has yeah. been a very successful book last year. Thank and you. So look much. forward to your second book. And uh, there's a debate about Tokyo Olympics, uh, you know, whether it should happen or uh, not happen. I've got that's another on debate, that, another that's, that's, for, that's for another day, Anurag. But thank I just you. want to tell you one exciting thing. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for your support of my book. We did the book launch together and it's such a special moment and a memory for me in India. The book is inspired by my time in India and Japan uh, and Singapore and beyond. There's a lot of Japan and India in there. Uh, but I just finished recording the audio book. So I recorded an audio book version of the book and it's gonna be available on Amazon and Apple Books uh, in the coming week or two. So that was a lot of fun, um, you know, actually sitting down in the studio and doing a lot of learning as well. It's not easy. I've gained a newfound respect for what you do all day long, Anurag. It's incredible, the energy you maintain uh, through this. But uh, yeah, again, thank you so much. God bless you. And to you.